spare panic attack. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, continuing with my analysis of Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare. Seeing what it tells us in terms of learning more about him as the primary victim of his wife, also understanding more about the world within which he operates to gain a greater understanding of how that all fits into the narcissistic dynamic. Harry explains that he thought that he would create something by the virtue of the International Warrior Games, which, as we know, became the Invictus Games, and thought that that would assist him in propelling him into the next stage of his post-war life. But unfortunately, that didn't come to pass. By the late summer of 2013, he was explaining that he was experiencing repeated panic attacks. He explained that his official life was about standing up in front of people and making speeches, uh, but all he wanted to do was run away, and he felt that he would actually one day just be seen racing off stage, and that, of course, would result in inevitable headlines, which increased his anxiety. He explained that it often started with him putting on his suit, and that was the trigger. He could feel his blood pressure rising, and that his throat was closing, and that sweat was running down his cheeks and back. He explains that he's always been sensitive to heat, like his father, and that he and his dad weren't made for this world. They found that um, Sandringham was quite a balmy environment, and the dining room was subtropical. They referred to it as their version of Dante's Inferno. And they, he explained that him or his father would wait for the Queen to look away, and then either he or his father would race to a window and crack it open an inch to let in some cool air. But then the corgis would complain about it, and then a footman would be promptly dispatched by the Queen to shut the window. Now, he said that any venue that he was appearing at felt like the Sandringham dining room. He then said that he basically not only feared public appearances, but all public venues and all crowds, and in time he feared simply being around other human beings. And he explained that the thing that he feared the most was the cameras, and that it would knock him sideways for a whole day. Well, he must have uh, somehow conquered that fear because he and his wife caught the cameras regularly. He explains he then started staying at home and he would sit around eating takeaway, watching 24 or Friends. And then he decided that he was Chandler. People commented he didn't seem like himself, that he apparently seemed like he got flu. And he wondered if this was a new self or whether this was what he'd always been. So he turns to Dr. Google to seek some explanations. And he kept trying to self-diagnose. He explained he met many soldiers, so many young men and women suffering from post-traumatic stress. And he'd heard how they talk about how it's difficult to leave the house. It was excruciating to be around a public space, particularly if it was loud. That they would try and manage the way that they interacted with crowds and public spaces and it didn't occur to Harry that he might be suffering from post-traumatic stress also. It didn't dawn on him that he was a wounded soldier and it wasn't the case that his war began in Afghanistan. It began in August 1997. So it's finally dawning on him that the stress that he's experiencing of course is linked to the loss of his mother. He moves on, explaining that he then telephones Thomas, who's the brother of his beloved mate, Henners, and that Harry was at Clarence's house. And he called Thomas, whose nickname appear was Boos, and he calls Harry Harris. Nobody else calls him that. And they had a conversation about missing Henners, and then... 
He thanked Harry for speaking at an event to raise money for Henna's charity. And that caused him to think about the event and that he would then have a panic attack. And then there's some reminiscing about lounging around at Highgrove, watching television, him and his brother, etc. And then there's a reminiscence, reminiscence about the nickname of Jack Russell's. And then he said that he heard the sound of Thomas screaming. There was angry voices and a scuffle. So he put the phone on speaker, ran down the corridor and burst into the police room and said that his mate was in trouble. The line had gone dead. Apparently he was at a restaurant in Battersea and Henry knew where he lived. So he then went to find him with several bodyguards and they found him on the side of the road. And he'd been beaten up. So they took him to the police and he signed a statement and then drove him home. And basically, it's an anecdote about showing how Harry looked out for him. Again, demonstrating the empathic side of Harry's behaviour in that he cares for the brother of his deceased friend, wanting to ensure that he's looked after and protected. Next, Harry tells us about being at Washington Airfield and a new desk that he's been given. And he's trying to go back to war, but... Uh, the army wasn't inclined to send him, and Afghanistan was winding down. Apparently Libya, though, was heating up, but the army said no, he wasn't going to do that. At the end of a typical working day, he'd leave Wattisham and drive back to Kensington Palace. He wasn't uh, staying with his father and Camilla. He'd been assigned his own place, a flat on Kensington Palace's lower ground floor. In other words, halfway underground. He then describes what the flat was like, and apparently somebody called Mr. R lived directly upstairs and used to like to park his massive grey discovery hard against the windows, blotting out all of the light. So Harry wrote him a note to ask if he might pull his car forward, and then he got a reply telling him to suck eggs. And apparently then Mr. R, whoever that is, went and told the Queen and asked her to tell Harry the same. And apparently Mr. R was one of Granny's equerries. And the fact uh, Harry reaches the conclusion that he feels secure enough in his position to go and ask the monarch uh, to put her grandson in his place. Harry tells himself that he should fight this issue, but ultimately the darkness of the flat suited his mood. And so it was the first time that he was living on his own and he invited a friend over who said that the, that flat reminded him of a badger set and they were having a drink and then went to the window and they looked like brown confetti falling and his friend asked is that hair and apparently it was it was mrs r giving a trim to one of her sons and shaking out the sheet in which she collected the clippings and gusts of fine hair blew into harry's flat which meant that when he and his friend coughed and laughed, they were picking off strands of hair. And uh, absolutely fascinating this, isn't it? He then decided he was going to compose his harsh note to Mrs R, but he never got around to it. So there we are. We learn about Harry moving into his own flat and getting hair on his tongue. Hmm. I'm sure that's happened to him in a more pleasant manner in the past. Next up, he becomes an uncle. And this merits what? I would say probably about 50 words. Uh, George is born. He says he's beautiful. And he wanted to teach him about rugby and Rourke's drift, flying and corridor cricket. And then also maybe a few pointers about how to survive life in the fishbowl. Harry reports that reporters asked him, was he miserable? Because it had moved him one link in the chain of succession downwards, making him fourth rather than third. But he said he couldn't be happier, which was a half-truth. He said he was delighted for Willie and Kate, but he was indifferent to his place in the order of succession. But ultimately, he wasn't anywhere close to happy. 
So those few chapters tell us about his panic attacks and how he's miserable Harry. Of course, all of this sets a scene to demonstrate once again just how easy it was for him to become ensnared by the narcissist because he's cut adrift, he sees his father, uh, sees his brother rather, moving on, married, having children, happy. He finds himself living in a badger set and having hair blowing through his window, contrasting fortunes and a somewhat self-pitying approach means that he was ripe for the plucking. Anyway, up next, Angola. Perhaps Harry will be a little bit more upbeat as it involves Africa. <laughs> 